Multiple friends of mine have seen the new Marvel movie Eternals this week, and all of them have given it rave reviews. Like, it certainly was a movie, and wow, there were actors in it, some of whom I like. I haven't seen it yet, and to be honest, I probably will not spend the money. But while I was talking to Wesley about it, they mentioned that one of the things they miss from modern cinema is the fact that nothing is ever a whole story anymore. Films are either ending on cliffhangers because it's the first or second film in a franchise, or it's taking place in some extended universe that requires knowledge of 19 other films to be enjoyable. Or its primary draw card is a 13-minute post credit scene that sets up some mega franchise that will eventually make like $15 billion and spawn 97 related movies and a video game. While this is partially to do with Marvel and their new movies behaving like TV setup, I genuinely believe in my heart of hearts that the real culprits in this scenario is the Harry Potter films which started their terrible reign 20 years ago and have somehow managed to not leave the cinema since, either through endless franchise opportunities or through the terrible legacy of the double film climax. And I want to yell about that. I'm Alex, this is Pop Culture Boner, the podcast edition, and today I'm thinking about how Harry Potter destroyed modern cinema. Okay, look, before we get into this, I need to make sure we're all on the same page. This episode is not about whether you love or hate Harry Potter, because there's actually a lot of directions that that could go, and frankly, most of them are real vortexes of horror. There's a whole episode's worth of content, for example, about the stranglehold that young adult fiction has on actual adults who are well beyond the target age group the role that the Potter novels played in cementing this phenomenon, and my own thoughts on how that's made us overall less literate and able to comprehend complex morality and fiction. Then there's the other, more pressing issue of J.K. Rowling's meteoric rise as a figurehead for so-called gender-critical feminism, which is just garden-variety transphobia, but with a shiny new name. That whole thing culminated in an essay by Rowling called Turf Wars, in which she reiterates the same tired bullshit rhetoric about detransition numbers, attacks in public bathrooms, and lesbians afraid of dying out as the butchers are forced into manhood and the ranks of women diminish in the face of more women or something. I don't know. For the record, as a lesbian, can I just say, given that trans women are in fact women and also sometimes, gasp, lesbians, It's not like we're an endangered species. And no one is taking the butchers away. The butchers are still very much there. I checked. (laughs) Anyway, it's a pretty incredible final move to dismantle her own legacy. But to be honest, the dismantling itself started much earlier than most people care to admit. There's nothing I can say on that that hasn't already been much more eloquently said by trans women who've done everyone the service of going through the essay point by point and debunking it with actual statistics. I'll link some of those in the notes for this episode. But lest you all think ill of me for doing a Harry Potter episode when we all know that Rowling is a horrible turf, or because you love the Potter franchise and you think it's salvageable from the clutches of its terrible turf author, just know that this episode is not actually about the Harry Potter content. (laughs) We can fight about whether art can be separated from artists and the real world harm they cause like we're first year philosophy majors another time. This episode's actually about the long-lasting impact that the film franchise had on the way that movies are developed, structured, and released. Film franchises obviously aren't a new concept. Wikipedia conflates a film franchise with a film series, defining them both as a collection of related films in succession that share the same fictional universe or are marketed as a series. I prefer to draw a distinction between the two, A series, to me, needs to be watched in order. The story is told over the course of many films, and pieces can be missed if you watch them out of order. A franchise, much like McDonald's, is something that's taking a world or a character and rehashing it either as a carbon copy or as something more modern. The Scream films, for example, are a series. They make sense watched in order, and they double down on their own meta-film commentary as they go along. Godzilla, on the other hand, is a franchise. 
There are 36 Godzilla films in total, dating back to 1954, and that doesn't include any television content that's been produced in-universe. Most of the films are Japanese, some are American. You can dive in at almost any point, because while they're all about a really big lizard, the plots are mostly unrelated. Now, obviously, this rule isn't hard and fast, and as the nature of the movie industry changes, the distinction between these two things becomes a little less clear. Sometimes it's just because something was an unexpected hit, and suddenly there's a whole lot of money available to make more movies. The Fast and Furious films are technically a series, but realistically, you could dive in at any point, as long as you know that family means everything. And that's because they started off as two primary films and a spin-off and then expanded massively when it became apparent that there was money to be made. It helps if you know the characters, but you could probably start watching it like movie five and still get the gist. Or it could be something like Halloween, which incorporates both series and remakes and retcons the later films to act as direct sequels to the originals. Halloween is really interesting because the 2018 film ignored all previous sequels and instead took a look at the intergenerational trauma of violent crime, which ultimately elevated it from a classic slasher to a really thoughtful reboot, while still keeping the original actors on board. I've mentioned horror films and monster movies because it used to be that these were the types of genres that attracted multiple sequels and expansions into ludicrous crossover films. They're niche enough that the average viewer doesn't expect real cinema, even if the originals are considered classics, and anyone willingly watching something called, like, Nightmare on Halloween Street 5, the Friday the 13th Chainsaw Massacre, is going in expecting to find their joy in an orgiastic splatterfest of movie gore rather than a carefully planned out crossover event that ties in neatly with the rest of the film series. But in recent years, it's become increasingly apparent that there's gold in them, there are hills. I mean, there's money in franchising. Like, huge money. And so we're looking at a huge suite of films which are connected, loosely or otherwise. I just took a look at the local chain cinema programming, for example. Of the 15 films playing, nine of them are either sequels or part of a larger franchise, Two, possibly three of them, are Marvel films. One of those is Venom, though, and I can't keep up with the whole Sony versus Marvel showdown, so I don't know where Tom Hardy's monster sex romp fits in. Let's just say three comic book movies. (laughs) One's a Bond film, and another one is the next installment in the Halloween franchise. My point is, not a lot of original content on show. But what's that got to do with Harry Potter? something which was essentially a self-contained series before the recent Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them series expanded it into cinematic universe franchise territory. Well, way back in 2007, the final Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, was released, and while it was decidedly chunkier than the others, it did mean that there was an end in sight for the film adaptations too. See, Warner Brothers had taken the then unprecedented step of purchasing the rights to the first four novels before the series had been fully finished. The first film came out in 2001, five years after the release of the first book, but a full six years before the final instalment. The rights were purchased from Rowling for an alleged £1 million, and it was essentially a large gamble that it would make money. But make money it did. Just... So very much money. $8.8 billion over the course of eight films. Yes, that's right. Eight films. But Alex, I hear you say, not to reveal myself as a fully-fledged Harry Potter nerd, but aren't there only seven books in the Potter series? Great point. There are only seven novels in the series. There are eight films because, according to the then president of the Warner Brothers Pictures Group, Jeff Robinov, the studio felt the best way to do the book and its many fans justice is to expand the screen adaptation of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows and release the film in two parts. Extremely generous of Warner Brothers to display such dedication to capturing the essence of the Potter novels in such meticulous on-screen detail. Definitely not an extremely transparent way to extend the cash-in period for a wildly popular and profitable series. 
From what I can see, there wasn't a huge amount of backlash to the idea of having the final novel split in half. Some mild suspicion maybe, but not a lot of like, hey, this seems like a cynical cash grab. Maybe people really thought the studio wanted to give a beloved franchise the send-off it deserved. And even if that genuinely was the intent, the split proved that you could effectively double your box office money. Part 1 made over $296 million at the US box office alone, and Part 2 made over $381 million. This is off the back of an alleged $250 million budget to cover both films, so it was essentially another educated gamble on Warner Brothers' part which paid off in a massive way. Why settle for a measly $300 million when you could make twice that? You just know that some movie executive got the world's fattest bonus that year. Now, all could have been well in movie land, except in the background of the Potter hype, another teen phenomenon was taking place. The Twilight Saga had become a best-selling, sexy, sparkly vampire phenomenon that had gotten a spicy film adaptation with two young, hot, and definitely in love stars at the helm. The novel series was four books, released between 2005 and 2008. The first film was released in 2008 the film rights having been purchased in advance of the final novel's release, as with the Potter series. As the third film was gearing up for release, rumours began to swirl. Summit Entertainment was going to split the final instalment, Breaking Dawn, in two. This, of course, turned out to be true, though they did so with much less fanfare than Warner Brothers. They simply confirmed that the rumours were true, that the final instalment was being split due to the novel's overall length, and went right ahead and released two films. Now, not to give Rowling too much credit, but if we're comparing writing ability, the Pottle novels are significantly more detailed and better written than the Twilight Saga. If we wanted to give Warner Brothers the benefit of the doubt, there's absolutely no room to do so with Stephanie Meyer, I'm sorry. There's no way enough things happen in that novel to warrant splitting it into two parts. It's an obvious attempt to replicate the phenomenal money-making success of the final two Potter films. And it worked. They essentially doubled their returns. The same thing happened again with the Hunger Games trilogy. Mockingjay was split into two parts. I'm sure if the Divergent series hadn't been such a flop at the box office, they would have done the same for its final installment too. But it turns out it's very difficult to take something seriously when the primary basis for one of the made-up social classes that supposedly divide your young adult protagonists is that they jog very fast to catch the train. I digress, but you should watch the first Divergent film, if only to be like, well, that certainly is a wildly impractical way of getting aboard a moving vehicle. (laughs) Anyway, the point is, it caught on. As long as you did some general hand-waving about capturing the essence of the book or something, people were willing to accept that they would have to pay twice to see the complete story. And then shit started to go awry. I actually wrote about this phenomenon back in 2012 when this podcast was still a blog, because it was announced that Peter Jackson's adaptation of The Hobbit would be split not into two but three films. Back then, I called it the Harry Potter split effect, and while I was willing to be a little bit more accommodating, I was still pretty annoyed, especially at the way artistic integrity was used to prop up something that to me felt like a pretty shameless desire to rake in the dollars while the getting was good. Peter Jackson's announcement, made on Facebook, stated that the team were really pleased with the way the story was coming together, in particular the strength of the characters and the cast who brought them to life all of which gave rise to a simple question. Do we take this chance to tell more of the tale? And the answer, from our perspective as the filmmakers and as fans, was an unreserved yes. To quote myself at age 22, and you'll forgive the deeply cringeworthy tone here, I'm sure the smell of money didn't hurt either. Three films? The Hobbit is one book and one story, Peter. Yes, it is set in J.R.R. Tolkien's very large Middle-earth universe. And yes, Tolkien himself said that it was a tale that grew in the telling. Yes, there's a lot of ground to cover. But I would just like to point out, Peter, that you made three Lord of the Rings films from the three much longer and much more convoluted Lord of the Rings novels. And let's be honest, you could have cut some of that shit out. 
The ending of Lord of the Rings Return of the King was about 25 minutes worth of unnecessary farewells that could have been much shorter if you just had Sam and Frodo make out. Now, at 31, I do still stand by that last bit. (laughs) Sam and Frodo giving in to their exceedingly obvious desire for each other would have really sped up the ending of Return of the King, and maybe I wouldn't have had to sit through 45 minutes of my dad's snoring in the cinema. Anyway, my blog post ended with an impassioned plea for Peter Jackson to call it off if it seemed like the trilogy as a whole wouldn't be good, because it was my favourite childhood book and I desperately wanted it to be good. Making it a single film was, interestingly, what Guillermo del Toro said they should do before he exited the film in 2010 due to production delays. Anyway, I'm a huge brain genius, and the Hobbit trilogy was as bad as I predicted it probably would be. In expanding the universe to visually elaborate on every minute detail in the book, they managed to drain all of the magic out of it. They're excessively long and deeply boring, so caught up in trying to get every single aspect of the world building right that they forget that most people actually really only care about the plot. As a whole, the trilogy received pretty mixed reviews, and by the third film, critics were resorting to increasing their star rating simply because the finale was shorter than the others, which is a great sign. But it made an absolute boatload of money. (laughs) Off the back of a $700 million budget, the trilogy made almost $3 billion. And that's just in the box office. It doesn't include all the endless merchandising opportunities that grow off the back of a huge franchise like that. And I don't think that that would have happened if they'd tried to adapt The Hobbit prior to the 2011 release of the final Potter film. If it had been made back in the early 2000s when the original Lord of the Rings trilogy was released, it would likely have been a single and reasonably succinct film that probably would have been much better overall. The Potter split taught movie studios that existing IPs with dedicated and excitable fan bases were a goldmine that they could stretch out for decades. And I think that's what's ultimately led us to behemoths like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. People were willing to accept expansions or alterations to original content, and their enthusiasm didn't wane when they had to wait for more and more films to get the full story. So suddenly we have a box office full of movies that are all playing in the same universe and are connected in a way that will allegedly only become apparent once we've spent our ticket money on 15 movies to see six cameos and 12 post credit sequences that will explain what the hell the big finale is all about. I've mentioned on this podcast before that despite the apparent market saturation with big blockbusters like Marvel, there hasn't actually been a significant dip in the number of mid-sized films being made. What I do think is interesting is that there seems to have been a knock-on effect where they apply the same Potter slash Marvel logic to mid-sized films with varying degrees of success. Things that were perfectly fine original mid-sized film ideas now have built-in contingencies in case it seems like there could be more money to be had. Even things adapted from existing comic book properties that could have easily been contained in a single film are now being milked for all they're worth. Take The Kingsman, for example. It's based on a short-run comic book series, and it could have been a totally fine standalone film. It could have even enjoyed a fun single sequel. Guess how many Kingsman films we're getting? Five. Five Kingsman films. Oh, and an eight-hour limited TV series. Did you want that? Did you need it? No. No one wanted that. (laughs) I'd be lying if I said the whole thing didn't bum me out a little. If you've made a perfectly fine and succinct film, you don't need to keep building it out. It doesn't need to have episodic TV logic or be split in half for artistic integrity or whatever. Sometimes I just want to sit in the dark and watch my stories and have that be the end of it. I don't think that's a huge ask. Fuck Harry Potter. Ruinous bloody film franchise. I wrote this episode so fast, just at the speed of light. It turns out I'm still really mad about this like nine years later. The Hobbit should have just been one film, god fucking damn it. (laughs) A one for one ratio is fine for adapting books. Not everything needs to go on the screen. Almost none of these sequels improve on the original. The exception to that, of course, is always 
Magic Mike XXL, which is high art, and I will not be accepting criticism. So, uh, if you'd like to explain how much you hate what capitalism has done to your beloved magic movies, or how much you love Magic Mike XXL, talk to me about it next time you see me at the pub. Peace!